My name is John Watts with Watts Digital Imaging here in San Diego. I'm a post-processing specialist for photographers. You take the perfect shot, and I hope you get the absolute most out of it, your printer or mine, and I can help you in three distinct areas, Photoshop instruction and services, LightJet digital printing and finishing, and color management products and services. I am working on a Mac. Don't let that scare you. I am running whatever the latest and greatest is the, of the Photoshop CC platform. When we're dealing with a complicated subject or complex subject like this, there's kind of a 20-80 rule. And you're going to remember 20% and probably forget the other 80%. Hopefully they're in the notes, or if not, you can always contact me. We can go from there. You'll also notice in the notes that I have a couple of pages of page o links, if you will. And so there's a whole bunch of different links there to my uh, website, my YouTube channel, the blog, which is educational. Plus, there'll be some posts in my blog that I'll refer to that you can consider that homework, in other words. Briefly about me, came out here for surfing in, in 1979, got involved in the one-hour lab craze, figured out, okay, I really like this post-processing gig. So I got involved in that, and in 1984, we started Watch Color Lab. This is a totally analog process. I mean, that's an analog and larger, just a light path and photographic paper, although very controlled and precise. Anyway, this is the light jet line today. We print with light, not with ink. It's using red, green, and blue lasers, and then it's processed in chemistry, which is what you see over here. And yeah, it is a dark room. We got to load rolls of paper. We use rolls of paper. Uh, as we're going along in this, the bottom right-hand side, you're going to see uh, the page that we are in the notes. So we are on page one. If you have my book or ebook, you'll find those page numbers here as you're uh, looking at the recording. Why color management? What is it and why do you need it? One of the critical elements in successfully uh, bringing an image from camera to its printed form is, colors, is color management. It'll allow you to print with a great degree of consistency and repeatability on either your inkjet printer or through a custom print lab. The ultimate goal of color management is to A, get as much information in your capture as you can, and two, make the most of that so that your monitor matches the output of your printer. Uh, it also allows you to print what, what you see on your monitor, which I just talked about, with a large degree of, of accuracy. Remember, those in the dawn of the computer age uh, would remember the WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get. Uh, you know, if you have bad input or bad color management, then you're going to have problems. And if you don't, I mean, you, if you have good input you're gonna, and good color management practices, then you're on the road to where you need, need to be. This is not in the notes, but it's just the third reason for having proper color management policies is to reduce the effects of tonal compression. Oh, the other thing too, I do free meetups and there's five free classes through every two weeks on Wednesday nights. I'm starting again on July 13. If you want to know more about that, you can scan and go to the page. Uh, but what I'm going to talk about on this tonal compression, I'm not going to spend much time with it, is from class one and three. We spend a lot more time on it. And so I'd encourage you to check that out or check out the free videos because I do record those meetups also. But basically what we're seeing here is if our eye I, I sees 100 shades of red, when we capture it in RAW, we're going to end up with about 70 shades of red. And by the time we bring it into Photoshop, we're down to 60 shades of red. And we go down to about 45 shades that we're going to print. Uh, we're going to print. There's nothing you can do about it. It's it's a physical property. And so that being the case, I just want to let you know that you can use WYSIWYG all you want, but because we're dealing with different light properties and what have you, it's never going to exactly match your monitor. It's physically impossible. We're looking at emitted light, which always has more brightness to it, and then you're looking at a reflective print, different physical light properties. So that's how you reduce that tonal compression, and one of the ways to do it is with color management. Again, uh, if you take class one and three, you'll see more about that. Also, what is a profile? You're going to hear me talk about this. Uh, this is the third bullet point down on page one. To accomplish a properly color managed workflow, you'll be creating and or using one or two profiles, one for your monitor and at least one if you have a home photo printer. So if you don't have a home photo printer, a printer dedicated strictly to photography, uh, a quality photo printer, and you're not going to need to worry about printer profiles, basically. Okay. A profile, by the way, is nothing more than a small file which tells your computer how to act and what to do you never even open it and this is one of those 20 percent things that i'm talking i'm going to talk about and this is also on page one and then we're going to discuss each one of these three steps in detail the three steps of successful color management for photographers is step one calibrate your monitor and create a monitor profile step two use a proper printer profile or create a custom printer profile and step three, assure that you have proper lighting conditions and perception. So let's talk about the first step. Step one, calibrate your monitor <clears throat> and create a monitor profile. Ble yes, we are. We're on page two now. There is an important color management rule and it is in a box there. To take advantage of all that your printer has to offer, match your monitor to your best printer output, not the other way around.
Most monitors off the shelf when you uh, receive them are way too cool color-wise and way, way too bright. I'm just going to let you know that now. So I've seen people that have their monitors not calibrated right, and they go to do everything they need to, and then they run it through their printer, and it goes, it looks nothing like my monitor. So you get your printer right, and we're going to talk about that in step two, and then you're ready to go. Let me go through uh, this before I, I talk about this slide here. Profiling your monitor is step number one, but let's face it, the main reasons most people avoid profiling your monitors are because they've got to buy something, which is true, and or they think it's too complicated, which is not true. The truth is it can be quite simple to get your monitor to closely match the output of your photo printer or favorite custom print lab. All you need are the right tools, the main one being a monitor profiling package, which consists of a piece of hardware called a colorimeter and the software that goes with it. This is a colorimeter. It's called an X-Rite i1 Display Pro, and I'll pass this around. This is not called X-Rite anymore. It's now, whoops, it's now called Calibrite. And just so you know, when I talk about this in here, there are actually a couple of different packages out there. The one I prefer is the X-Rite or the Calibrite product. Those things are running about $250 right now with the software. You load the software, and then you basically, as you can see on the picture on page two, you uh, hang that on your monitor and run the software through. Oh, I should mention on page two, purchasing a monitor profile, this may answer your question, is an option right now, and this is down there at the bottom of page two. You can use the buy eye calibrators built into your computer's operating system. It's far from a perfect solution, and I use it as a last resort. And I'm going to show you why in just a minute because it's very subjective. It talks about how to do that. Now let's go to page three. And it talks about using the advanced mode in your software, whether it's the Color Vision Data Color product or it's the X-Rite slash Calibrite product. I would suggest that you start by filling in in the advanced mode these three uh, parameters. Color temperature is, is measured in degrees Kelvin. A smaller Kelvin value is warmer, has more of a yellow cast, than a larger Kelvin value, which is cooler, has a blue cast. And the next is gamma. is a function of uh, contrast and midtones. Just leave it at 2.2. That's it's pretty much universal, Mac or PC. And lumens uh, are a measurement of brightness. A lower luminance value is darker than a higher luminance value. When we set up for the fair, we used 6,000 degrees Kelvin, 2.2 gamma, and 110 lumens. For the light jet, I suggest 5,500, 2.2, and 110. Either one of those are going to get you where you need to be. It's going to certainly, like Larry says, it's going to be better than nothing. And you want to cut down on time wastage. You want to cut down on if you're printing from a home printer, having to print six or seven test prints to get it right. The more you can get done on your monitor, the less you're going to spend in hassles with printing. Okay. And this brings up another point about what Larry said. I mentioned starting point. And he's right there. If you start with these numbers that I have here, and after you've run some prints and your images that you get, whether from a print lab or whatever, are coming out consistently cooler, then change it to 6,000 or 6,500K to warm it up. Or if the prints are coming out considerably darker than what you're seeing on your monitor, then recalibrate from, say, it was 110, bring it down to 100. Or like Larry says, depending on the, the, the monitor, it may be down to 90. Does that, that sounds about right, right? Okay, and there's a procedure there that I just mentioned, which we don't need to spend any time on, to zero in your optimal monitor settings for whatever your printer is. How often to profile? That's a real good question. Monitors tend to drift. I'm on page three, near the bottom. Color-wise, they tend to drift. You'll need to recalibrate and reprofile on a regular basis, approximately every three to four months, uh, even longer with newer monitors. I've got a monitor that's maybe a year and a half old. Every three or four months, and I'll reprofile. It takes about 15 minutes per monitor. I have an external monitor, okay? And yes, I do profile both of them, just so you know. I see very little difference when I reprofile every three or four months on a newer monitor. If you don't have one of these devices in the software, buy it with a friend. Split the cost. You only need it for 15 to 20 minutes every three or four months. The software, it's legal to load it in multiple computers, okay? So it's just the hardware. So, you know, if you got two or three people, I've always thought camera clubs should do it, but I can understand why they don't, is to uh, have these things available to check out, and you got one month to bring it back to the next meeting. You know, and you have three of these and rotate them so people could do that. I, just a thought, but, you know, I'm not, I wouldn't want to be in charge of it. But, you know, the, the fact is you don't need them that often. But when you need them, you need them. By the way, if you have printer profiles, which we're going to talk about next, they'll last years, literally years, if you're not changing your ink or your paper or any of those various variables. Various variables? That works. Let's go ahead and go to step two, page four. 
I'm not going to spend too much time on this one, mainly because this may not necessarily ap apply to you if you are using an outside lab. A printer profile makes the most out of your printer's capabilities by characterizing the behavior of your printer ink paper combination, or in my case, it's the laser output and the chemistry. You need one printer profile for each paper ink printer co uh, resolution combination that you print on. Unlike a monitor profile, a printer profile will not drift appreciably unless you change printers, ink type, brands, whatever. If you've got an Epson printer, keep using Epson inks. If you've got a Canon printer, keep using Canon inks. Do not buy the generic inks on eBay. There's no consistency in those. Canon, HP, and Epson are not in the printer business. They're in the uh, consumables business, ink and paper. That's where they make most of their money. Don't get me wrong, they earn it because they're very, very consistent between batches, which is why a printer profile, if you don't change any of those variables, will last for a long time. If you go to page four, it says choices for printer profiles. If you're using an outside print lab, use printer profiles provided by that print lab if you want. Most quality print labs, if, like myself, implement custom printer profiles into their workflow and should gladly supply them to you, but for informational purposes only, achieved by soft proofing, which we're going to spend very little time with today because I don't do it, hardly ever. By following the three steps of successful color management listed on page one and setting up your file the way you, your lab needs it, you can achieve excellent results without ever physically visiting the lab. I got clients I've never met physically all over the country, knowing how your image will look with a great degree, degree of accuracy. Does anybody here have their own dedicated photo quality printer? Okay. Basically, you've got two choices for profiles. You can use the CAN printer profiles for your inkjet printer. And I used to say CAN in a derogatory manner, but you can't anymore. They're actually pretty darn good. When you load the software for your CAN and HP or Epson printer, they usually load their various uh, printer. Like, you know, you're using Epson Premium Luster. They're going to have a profile. Use it. And if you don't know how, then talk to me afterwards and I'll turn you on to some information that will tell you how to use it properly. The second way is use the custom printer profiles for your inkjet printer. I do create custom printer profiles. If you were to take 10 Epson 2800s and put them here in, for, in a row and use the same computer and print it on each one, they're all going to be a little different. Okay? When you're using a CAM profile, you are indeed using an average, if you will, which is definitely better than nothing, but if you need the precision of a custom printer profile, then talk to me and I can help you do that. The third step to successful color management is actually the one that people have the most trouble with. I think this will answer a lot of your questions that we were talking about as far as lighting. Everybody here knows the lighting is poor. It's, the lighting is great for betting on horses. Really, I mean, it kind of, you know, it is the way it is, and we're going to have to live with that. Now, most of the judges have been in this industry professionally for so long that we recognize instantly there are problems with the lighting, and that a lot of times when we're looking at Tier 2 prints, we'll have them move it around a little bit. There are certain spots in there in the place that are a little better than others. Okay, with that in mind, let's talk about Step 3. Assure that you have proper lighting conditions and perception. This is the most overlooked step in color management. I truly believe this. Do not underestimate how easily our eyes and by extension our brain can be tricked. Perception is not always reality. Just watch any good magician like Bullwinkle and Rocky here uh, at work. Okay, now he wasn't a very good magician, but still. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a couple of tricks of the eye. All right. What I'd like you to do is look at the X in the middle, the black X. And after a few seconds, you're going to see a green dot that's kind of clockwise you see that doesn't exist this is a trick of the eye literally magicians make a fortune doing this but we know ahead of time that our eyes they're gifts from god but they're imperfect let's go to the next one here this one's not quite as dramatic but still if you look at the intersections of the white and the black lines you're going to see a little gray square the, again, the gray square doesn't exist. L let me go on to some other ones that are even more dramatic, actually, like this one, which used to be my favorite when the chargers are here, but the chargers are now dead to me. If I could change the color of this, I would, but what I'd like you to do, if you'll look, you'll see with the vertical black lines, it looks like it's jumping from line to line, but you remove the vertical black lines, and they're nice and smooth. They're actually smooth on both of them. It's just the black lines make it look like they're jumping, and they're really not. Now you see why you want to get the color management house in water. And now you see why you want to avoid adjusting your monitor subjectively. Okay, this one's kind of tricky. If you look at this green line right here, and then you'll see this blue swirl right here, it's true, they are the exact same color. If I were to get the eyedropper out, they are the exact same color, and you're going, but John, but John, how can that be? Real easy. The blue line actually has purple slices going through it, and the green line has orange slices going through it. 
and so it pulls your eye off from what the color really is. I've actually gotten the, the eyedropper tool out and checked this, and it is true. This is one of those, do not look at this when you have been drinking or doing heavy drugs. Uh, and we have another one like this. But wherever your eye goes, you're going to see those white dots, and you don't in the other. I honestly don't know whether they exist or not. I don't know what, what is real. All I know is every time I move my eyes over that, that <laughs> something different is happening. Okay, this is another one. There's no movement in this, by the way. Okay, this is your eyes making these move. Do not look at this one. I mean, I get sick almost looking at it, but it's your eyes that are making it move. It has nothing to do with any motion that I'm adding. This one you're going to find interesting. I think all of you will. What do we have for matte colors in, in the fair? Black and white, right? Look at that gray square. That's 50% gray. Look at the difference in how dark it looks with the white background and how light it looks with the dark background. So when I get questions at the judges' roundtable about which matte color should I use, the answer is it depends. It really does depend. And you can see why. I think that's one of the more fascinating ones. This is why you want to get your color management house in order. This is another one where the orange ball is the same size regardless of what it's doing. This is another good one here. What you want to do is stare at the white dot in the center of the spiral for about 15 seconds and then look down at Starry Starry Night. And after about 15, I'll sing the Jeopardy song. No, I won't. And all of a sudden, you'll see that the swirls are moving. And again, that's your eyes moving it, you know. This is why you want to get that color management house in order. Here's another one. If you stare at the white dot on the nose of that handsome dude there, I don't know. And then stare at the white thing. You're going to see a picture of me. Okay. Handsome devil, eh? So I'm also, I'm a, a, a poet. There's some of my poetry. Rods and cones are nature's own, but our eyes will still deceive us. So how can you reduce some of these problems? And let's go ahead and go to the next one here. Number one, change monitor screen theme colors to neutral gray. I love my grandkids, and they're cuter than yours. I just want you to know that. But the fact of the matter is, when you look at my desktop, everything's gray. And <laughs> there's a reason for that. You don't want your eyes to be pulled off by a bright color that shouldn't be there. Reduce room lighting. I'll show you a picture of my little office in a minute so you can see what I'm talking about. Avoid loud wall colors. And I'm using this because I actually had somebody up in Pasadena that was having problems with warm prints. And she was viewing it in a room similar to this. Okay. No, 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 no. Now, you don't need to make your walls perfectly 18% gray or anything like that. You know Al Bruton, right? Okay. Al Bruton gunited his pool 18% gray about 15 or 20 years ago because he does a lot of underwater photography. And he also filled it with salt water. Yes, you can take it to extreme, but that's not extreme. He was making a darn good living at it. Avoid loud wall colors. Be conscious of the color of your clothes. There's a reason that Larry and I are wearing black shirts. Well, besides the fact that we're both fashion icons, because you don't want to be wearing Elvis's Hawaiian shirt because you're going to get pulled off big time. Okay, last thing, and then we'll move on. I just want to show you this is my office here. Now, the walls are kind of a neutral yellow, which you can't really tell. This is actually taken during the middle of the day, and I've kind of brightened it up. It's actually darker than this. This is 3 o'clock in the afternoon. That's a west-facing exposure. Basically, when I set this up right, my monitors look the same regardless of the time of day. So you want to do that, too. Use proper light source for viewing your prints. If you look at this under this light, those grays, and that's what you want to look at, those grays look yellow because our light source is very yellow, right? Now, when I put it under a 5,000-degree Kelvin, looky there, boys and girls. Now, I wish we had this for every one of our prints out there, but we don't. But this is the standard, 5,000 degrees Kelvin at about 110, 120 lumen. You don't need to spend a fortune. I went to that great photographic supply house known as Walmart, and I bought this black goose lamp with a white interior. Then I went to that other great photographic supply house, Amazon, and ordered some contact fluorescence in 5000K. I think I got $20 into that thing. Is it good for big prints? No, but it's good for viewing 11 by 14s and 16 by 20s. I think that pretty much is it. I would suggest you read page 7 on soft-proofing your image. I do not recommend that you soft-proof your image. And thank you very much.